This episode of the Beauté by ABIG podcast is brought to you by Beauty and Aesthetic Insurance Brokers. Hello and welcome to the Beauté by ABIG podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Here, we are strengthening and unifying the industry through representation, innovation and education. This is a platform created and dedicated to the aesthetic and beauty industry, valuing unity and advancement. We serve to represent, support and inspire you by connecting you with industry experts, expanding your knowledge through educational pieces and bringing you the latest industry news. This is Beauté by Avic. I'm your host, Stephanie Miller, and today's guest is Chris Curtis from Beauty and Aesthetic Insurance Brokers. Chris is the Senior Account Manager for Beauty and Aesthetic Insurance Brokers and has been looking after clients' business insurance needs for almost 20 years. He is a wealth of knowledge and experience regarding all things insurance with an in-depth understanding of the beauty and aesthetic industry. Chris has achieved many accolades over his 20-year career, including a diploma in accounting and holds a business degree majoring in both finance and human resources, and is a registered member within the insurance industry. Here to discuss the hidden dangers of underinsurance from beauty and aesthetic insurance brokers. Today, we welcome Chris Curtis. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. How are you today? I'm good, Steph. Good morning to everyone listening. Chris, you are a new and very, very exciting foundation member of the Aesthetic and Beauty Industry Council. Congratulations and welcome to the fold. Thank you very much. And thank you to the uh, Abic family for uh, inviting us to join this uh, lovely journey of this. We've got much to do for the industry and part of it is education letting everybody in our industry know the specifics about insurance for the beauty and aesthetic realm, which is quite (laughs) huge, (laughs) right? Um, Of course, very huge. So we've got four, as we know, we've got four sectors of the beauty and aesthetic industry. There's beauty Mm -hmm. services, beauty therapy, dermal therapy, and medical aesthetic, and Mm -hmm. the beauty and aesthetic insurance brokers covers all four sectors of the industry from beauty all the way to medical aesthetics. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. We look from all visions of your industry, um, which we um, provide insurance solutions for um, tailored to each individual person or, and or business. Well, that's wonderful. At today, we've got a lot of information all about the dangers, the hidden dangers of underinsurance. But before we start, Chris, I would love our listeners to know a little bit more about you and your expertise in this area. Tell us all about you and your journey into aesthetics. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not actually doing aesthetics. I'm not qualified to begin with. Um, <laughs> what I am qualified for is um, to give insurance advice. Now, I've been doing this for over almost well, 20 years thereabouts. And it's amazing how the years um, creep up on you when you're busy enjoying what you're doing. Like I said, I've been dealing business insurance or doing a lot of commercial insurance for the last 20 years, particularly focusing on the beauty and aesthetic and um, health industry overall, um, which we're professionals at. And we've you know come to know the industry quite um, intimately and in depth, um, obviously dealing with people such as yourself over the years and getting to understand you know, your operations and what you guys are trying to achieve. You know, we're qualified in all aspects of it um, from both insurance uh, industry and also from um, providing correct advice to all um, people out there in that industry. And we try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to understand because we know that insurance is not everyone's forte. uh, And, but, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, in the event of anything happening to anyone's business, from someone getting sued from a poor uh, treatment or physical damage to their own premises and operations that, you know, we, we help them try to get their business back up and running with the correct insurances in place. Mm. And there's so much to know, isn't there? So much, so many little pitfalls and hidden kind of areas when it comes to insurance. 
but I think we're in safe hands with such an experienced organization and also person. I know that you provide insurance to some of the very big companies within the, the beauty and aesthetic industry from manufacturers through to suppliers and also mm-hmm. through to spas and clinics and so forth. So your expertise yeah. is quite in depth in this area. Um, and part of your ethos is to educate whilst you're, you know, providing information and making sure that everyone's insured properly. Mm-hmm. It's really to educate the industry, which is wonderful. There's so many different areas of insurance. It's so hard to wrap your head around. Would it be possible for you today to give us a rundown of the basic, you know, I think there's four or five basic areas where we need to be insured mm-hmm. as business owners yeah. or professionals. Can you go through those for us today? Yeah, of course we can. Just to begin with, um, what people don't may not understand or have a, a knowledge or head around it is insurance is a transfer of risk. So you're transferring all your risk that you would have in the event of something happening, unforeseen events, damages, you're transferring all that risk to someone else to end up backing you up and paying if anything was to get done. And that's what that thing is, transfer of risk. And, and by transferring the risk and providing insurers with the much information, you, you become more wanting to get insurance from other people rather than saying, well, this person is running a great clinic practice here. We will take them on board. Or this person is not running a great clinic. We've got a, more of a risk of a claim happening at that premises or that person, the way that they're trading. We really don't want to take them on. So you sort of limit who you can go to and the way you can arrange your insurance. But like we said, in that in your industry, to begin with, there are three or four different, we would say, core insurance products that you need to take out. First one is professional indemnity or and or combined public liability insurance. Now that just as an overview covers your business in the event of being someone injured as a result of your treatments that they're conducting at your clinic. Um, that's required for a lot of things too, for even you opening up your doors at a at a location, whether it's a strip shop, shopping mall, um, local councils, trading footpath. If you want to put a A-frame board at the front to advertise your business, you need to have public liability. You can't proceed unless you have that. So that's the main core insurance that you need to start off with. You're saying you really shouldn't, you legally, you can't open your doors without this particular type of insurance. I don't think everybody understands that. Um, because there are, unfortunately, some businesses that don't have insurance at all. Um, that's a big no-no, right? It's it's not legally correct or sound not to have public liability insurance if you're going to trade or open your doors to the public. Yeah, that's pretty much all I'm spot on because you are signing into a lease agreement to use someone else's premises. And on that lease agreement, it actually states that you really should have some form of public liability insurance. If you open the doors without it, then you could run yourself into a bit of an uh, issue with the, the landlord at all council or the area that you're operating from. What about if you're a sole trader and you're operating from home? Is there a legal requirement to have public liability insurance? Yeah, there is still because you're letting people into your home for a business practice operation. Your house insurance will not provide you any coverage under public liability. So, you know, you're inviting someone to your house. For what reason you're inviting them to the house? To do a treatment. If they trip over or anything happens whilst in your care at that time, you need to make sure you are covered to operate from your house as well. Because even the council might come knocking on the door and saying, hey, we, we notice that you're operating from your house. What do you have in place? Do you have public liability in place? Right. So this is the thing that I think is probably will surprise many sole traders or people in our industry that have perhaps come out of beauty school or mm. um, just finished their education and want to do some clients at home. This is one very important area for them to understand is that you actually need to set up public liability insurance, if not a few mm. others as well. I'll let you continue on with the rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. You need to st- take that. That's the one core um, policy you need to take out. Like I said, whether you are doing a sole trader from home, you're opening up your own business, you need to have that done or arranged just so you can cover yourself, you know, because at the end of the day, we don't want anything to happen. But if something wants to happen, you need to make sure you've got things in place so to cover you for any litigation costs that may event because of a bad or reactive to a treatment. The next core product would be the physical asset, as we call it, or business insurance, to arrange coverage for the physical assets. Um, you know, as we all know, these 
mechanisms or machines that everyone's using for any type of laser treatment, tattoo removal treatment, facial treatment, any type of treatment using a machine of some sort, even small machines, small pots, whatever you might have, they're all costs. So you need to make sure you've got that arranged insurance in event of anything happening to them physically, whether they get water damage, fire damage, you know, accidental damage, you need to have some form of insurance to cover you in the event of anything happening to them. Because you're investing your money into those machines to operate your business. If they get damaged, you can't, you know, you probably paid 50, 70, 80, 100,000, 150,000 for a machine. You want to make sure that if that machine gets damaged, that it can get repaired or replaced for you to continue your operation. And what types of damage does that cover? I remember I actually had some water damage. We had a spillage onto one of our machines and that was covered. That was an accidental spillage of distilled water into the machine that, mm. that kind of fried some components in it. We actually were covered. Yeah. Is, some, is that an, an extra type of insurance or does that cover it within the That scope? is covered. It's covered within the scope with that business insurance. So you've got your property damage, which covers you for your fire, water damage, accidental damage, you know, depending on, on the incident that occurs to cause the damage to the machine. And then you've got other aspects of the policy that covers you for glass damage, burglary, money. That's going for someone that's operating a business from a premises as well, which more detailed to be provided with a one-on-one -on -one consultation with us to explain those different coverages. But the main area is your property damage, like you said, Steph, covering you for water damage or accidental damage. You know, someone dropping a handpiece, for example, well, those handpieces are pretty expensive. Someone dropping a handpiece, that needs to, you know, that will fall under accidental damage if your policy has been structured correctly. And you know that a lot of um, people don't actually know that. I didn't, mm. I think I knew it, but I didn't realise it because there's that many times that a staff member has, you know, snapped a fibre or, or dropped a handpiece and I, I really haven't claimed it. <laughs> and um, yeah. really, I, I sort of, you know, you blank out thinking, you know, you just repair, pay the bill and kind of move on. But yeah. say, you can actually call your, up your, your insurance broker and say, look, this has actually happened and put in a claim. Mm. What happens when you do? Does that raise your premiums if it only happens once or twice a year? Oh, look, depending on the magnitude of the premium, at the moment we are seeing, unfortunately, premiums are increasing because of the way that the current economic environment is. So, you know, if you're doing small claims, like I say to my clients, look, you might as well do a claim if you obviously have the opportunity or something has happened, make the claim, get your money back. You're paying the insurance. That's what insurance is for, to help you get you back or pay you for something that's been damaged or during an unforeseen event. You know, if you have a massive fire claim, well, yeah, your premiums will go up. They don't go up dramatically. They go up in a good scale, but they will never go up dramatically to make it unaffordable. Very, very important to know. Mm. You should put in a claim, especially if it's small to medium size, and the larger claims do, I know that from experience, they do affect mm. your um or what you're going to pay for the year, I mm. suppose, your, your premium, but mm. not that much, not as much as I thought. You know, I was quite surprised. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there, there, there's ways, you know. Um, that, that's what our job is, to make sure that we educate people about their insurance products and, and what to, um, how to arrange it, you know, how to, um, can we make a claim? You always consult with us. Like, Steph, you know, you always call me up and say, hey, this has happened. What's the scenario? Am I covered? Am I not covered? Can we make a claim? We'll run through the um, the facts of what's actually occurred to determine whether a claim can be lodged with the insurer. Mm. And tell us about business interruption insurance. This is a fascinating yep. one. Yeah, business interruption insurance is basically there to protect you for unexpected disruption to the business. You know, the main things which we talked about, fire, flood, storm, causing damage to your premises and you can't operate anymore. So obviously there's, more, this is more related to people running their own practice. Can't get your, your staff coming back or the staff want to get paid. You can't get your customers because the clinic's not um, able to trade. You know, this pays for your gross profits. If, if arranged correctly, can assist you to put yourself back to where you were or at least keep you afloat until the business is able to recover after a major loss. You know, 25% of small businesses say they would have to shut down 
if they experience a business disruption as a major fire storm. That, that's a high statistic. Another statistic, nearly 80% of business in policies out there actually don't have business interruption. So like you said, that's a high statistic for people not having a cover, but also if they were to have a major unexpected disruption of the business, will affect them to be able to bring themselves back up, especially if you've been running a business for five to 10 years, you know, successful, you've built yourself a great brand and everything. People do become sad that their business is shut, but unfortunately people also look elsewhere for their other services when you're not around. So you need to make sure that that is arranged properly, you know, and you, your bills will still keep coming in. Your water bills will come in, your rent, your rates, gas, um, electricity, you know, your wages too, you know, people still, you're still obliged to pay people their wages or their um, leave entitlements if they were to leave. So that is a big cost to a business. If there's no money coming in because you're not trading, but you need to pay out all this money because you've had an interruption and you can't trade. Mm, it can be in the thousands and tens of thousands. Um, oh, of and, course. You know, depending on the size of the business. And the bigger the business is, the the harder it's going to be hit, I suppose. Mm. Like, even smaller businesses, if they don't secure themselves with business interruption, can find themselves mm. in failure um, quite quickly within the first month. Uh, well, that's right. And, and the repairs can take months on end. It, it's different if, you know, you damage a wall, you call up a hand in hand and fix it. Well, that's fine. But when, you, when you're involved in the insurance process, things do take a bit longer than normal because like I said at the start of the podcast, you're transferring the risk and the risk is on the insurer and then you're bound by their um, terms and conditions on how the repair process will be undertaken and when, you know, they get their loss adjusters coming in. So that you can take anywhere between two to three, four months shutdown to get everything organised. And as we know, there's supply and demand issues. Demand of repairers, demand of builders, trades, material, all that is being delayed and accumulates to when repairs will start for you or when you fall into that line. Beauty and Aesthetic Insurance Brokers are a division of ADK Insurance Brokers and have been providing exceptional service to clients in all industries for the past 20 years. Beauty and Aesthetic Insurance Brokers specialize in the unique needs of the beauty and aesthetic industry. Understanding that insurance is not a one-size-fits-all product, they offer customized solutions to ensure clients have the best coverage and risk management in place for their business. With a team committed to guiding clients through the claims process from start to finish, they work directly with insurance on behalf of clients. By staying up to date on the latest changes in the insurance market, they offer ongoing education and support to their clients. Beauty and aesthetic insurance brokers, providing personalised and comprehensive insurance solutions to valued clients. Especially now we're seeing a lot of catastrophes going on within the industry or within around Australia where, like I said, supply and demand issues. People's insurance policy programs or coverages has been accepted. They just can't get the physical repairers there or the machines provided to get them up and running in a timely manner. So and that's why business interruption is really, really crucial to have. And I've been on the receiving end of that. Um, so I know exactly how long repairs take. You can be, you can yeah. be spot on shut down for three to four months at least. And mine was quite a quick repair process after our flood, uh, mm. being shut down literally bang on, I think four months. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I thought we'll do this within a month. We'll repair it uh, within a month. It's not how it works. You have to go through the whole yeah. process with the insurance company. So business interruption, if I didn't have it, then I would have been in very bad yeah. trouble. You know, I would have been one of those statistics. And, um, and I know so many others as well that would have been in the same boat if not for that type of insurance. Tell us about management liability. Management liability is another one for those people. More for, This is more for business owners that are um, you know, starting to employ people. So th this policy is basically covering you liable for any actual or alleged breaches of a Corporations Act. 
and not just large companies are exposed about this. Small and medium business owners and officers could be at risk because this not only covers you as a business owner, it covers your managers as well and any, anyone um, representing the business themselves. So, but it also you know can cover you for unexpected legal costs for the business, you know, covering you know from unfair dismissal claims to um, statutory liability claims to other areas of you know your company's breaches for wrongful acts you know by the company present and future directors officers managers against wrongful acts such as misrepresentation or breach of duty um, depending on the business size so and that also covers you for theft by employee as well or theft by a third party depending on the product right so okay. that 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 is a great policy to have um it, it's we call it a sleep easy at night for business owners so if you've got this you can sleep a bit easier at night knowing that if anything was to come about main main claims are, are, that are happening around this type of product are unfair dismissal claims or um, harassment claims coming across you know fair work gets involved and then insurers companies get involved with their lawyers and it goes through mediation process i see so it's a protection for the managers and the owners of mm. the business in case an employee or in case a legal matter arises, all of those mm. bills and those fees and the payout to the person is covered. Mm. Yeah, that's right. So it's covering defence costs and it's covering any payouts within the scope of the cover. Okay, wonderful. Good to understand mm. that type of insurance. Because as we all know, as, yeah, as we all know, you know legal, legal fees aren't, exactly cheap these days so the defense costs do mount up and that's where you know you don't want to be out of pocket for defense costs going into the tens or twenty thousand of dollars for a, for a court case whether you you know it was a wrongful act whether you were misrepresented incorrectly it's defending you and your managers that are acting on your behalf of the business one question this these insurances are amazing to have when you have them, what happens if you don't have the right amount of cover for each of those insurances? We call this underinsurance. Yeah, with underinsurance, there's two terms for underinsurance. There's underinsurance where you don't have enough coverage, so enough products to protect your business, and that's why we do a risk analysis of every individual business owner to determine what policies they need to take out to protect their risk overall so they're not underinsured. You know, i.e., they didn't take out management liability. So that's underinsured because they didn't take out that product. Then you've got underinsurance where you actually are insuring your physical asset, but you're not insuring it for the correct replacement value. So, you know, you, you should you could have a, a clinic fit out for about two hundred thousand, including all your machines, but really you should have insured for half a million or six hundred thousand. Well, you are underinsured and insurers have clauses in their wordings to not penalise but reduce the amount that they pay in the event of a claim saying, well, hold on, you underinsured your total replacement value of your policy, therefore we're not going to pay out the full amount of the claim, we'll only pay out a portion of it and you're left to pay for the remaining costs of that claim that's happened, whether your machine is you know, 100000 but you're only insured for fifty, dollars well, you're not going to even get fifty for it. Not even going to get 50 for it. Wow. Um, so let's give an example for everybody listening. If let's mm. just say my clinic is insured for $450,000 and I have three machines, each $150,000, and yep. I only insure, really, I should be insured for four fifty or even mm. six hundred dollars because you're, you're wondering, you know, obviously there's assets, other assets other than machinery in your business. You're only yep. insured for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and one of those one hundred and fifty thousand dollar machines breaks. Because I'm insured for two hundred and fifty, do I get the one hundred and fifty for my machine? No, flat out no. The insurers will come in and assess with the loss adjusters and say, "Well, hold on, you should, like you said, you should have been six hundred thousand. You've saved a bit of premium by um, reducing your cover." Um, understandable, but because of that clause, they'll say, well, that machine damage is 150, but because you underinsured by a percentage, well, we're not going to pay 150, we'll probably pay $75,000 to replace that machine. Right. So they're so almost like a pro rata, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, it's like a pro rata. So they've got a percentage in there. You know, each policy has its different under insurance clauses. So some have got 50%, 80%, 70%, depending on which product it is. So, and then that way they will possibly, in the event of a claim, unfortunately. And then that's when you get the backlash of people saying, oh, insurance doesn't pay out. Insurance, you know, is just, you know, taking our money but not paying us out properly. Like we all know, there's two edges to a story, two edges to a double-edged sword, you know, and that's what my role is to help educate my clients and representatives and people within the ABEC industry to say, hey, you know, we're insured correctly. Let them understand the pitfalls of arranging the policy correctly, what values. Look, we're not valuers, but obviously business owners will know how much it costed to fit out the clinic, how much it costed for them to finance for their new machine or get those new machines, ordering new machines, always changing and upgrading their machines, you know, let us know. So we know that we're at the value because at the end of the day, if we do have a claim, we want to make sure that everyone's going to get their money's worth. And, you know, we're there every step of the way from a claim to make sure everyone's fine from the good times to the bad times, to the cries, to the yelling, to everything all going on. We're there to try help everyone going on. We don't want to get to that scenario. So we try to arrange the policies as best we can at the start by consulting. And every year too, we consult every year changes. It's not like we said, I think we spoke about it yesterday, Steph. You might take it insurance today and you may not look at it for three years, four years. Your business changes. Your business has evolved from a from someone starting in their in their house, you know, with one machine, and then all of a sudden they can't operate from the house. They have to go find uh, somewhere to trade from, a shop, an office, a clinic. Then that that business is growing, which is great. As your business grows, so does your insurance policy grow. We're there every step of the way to make sure that everyone is insured to the best of their ability. Because if you know, you've built this hard business, the last thing you want to turn around and say is, sorry, Steph, you didn't review your policy. We've only got this much cover. You know, that machine that's burnt, damaged, I know you spent 150, it's going to cost you 150 to repair or replace, but the insurance company is only going to give you this much because we haven't reviewed it every year. We haven't looked at it every year. You know, I've got a great scenario where someone came to me the other day three years into their business, their business has grown over to a million and a half and they didn't change their policy once. And they had the same values that they had for their contents and machine equipment at 50,000. They had nearly $600,000 worth of equipment and they didn't review it on a yearly basis. And they were terrified that something was to happen overnight and we were able to arrange the policy, you know, within a good 24, 48 hours, turnaround time to make sure that they get it right premium was okay and, and they were ecstatic because they're like well hold on i'm trading at the moment if anything happens excuse the word i'm screwed and we're like yeah that's all right just calm down we'll get it organized we get some policies in, in place and that's when they arrange the policy with the direct market as we call it you know your double mines and gio that's the direct market we don't deal with that space we're a specialist insurance brokerage where we that's our focus is people's businesses and livelihoods being treated as if it's ours. It's so important. I love the way that you treat your your clients as as though this was happening to them, as though th- their their business is your business. When you go direct to the insurance company, of course, they'll slap on whatever price you whatever you, amount you want to insure for. They will do mm. that. They won't consult with your business. They won't look at your business. They won't see what types of insurances you actually do need. And that's the difference between having an insurance broker. Also, insurance brokers hold your hand through the whole process of a claim. Yeah, that's right. It's very different. And not only that, they are act on your behalf as advocates for you. So they're like the, the go-between. So the insurance company will speak to the insurance broker and they know they can't get away with funny business because the insurance broker knows exactly what the law is and exactly what's in the policy. And so they, they won't be able to um, sort of nudge either way with the client because they've got the protection of the insurance broker there advocating for them like a lawyer would advocate really for you um, in a claim. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. That's that's what I, the real role is. You know, we're engaged by you and you are our client. We don't act on behalf of the insurers. We act on behalf of yourself and, and ABIC members who, are in, who have engaged us to be your, like you said, we are your advocate in between the insurers and in yourself. Mm, so good to know. Let's end the podcast on a very, very interesting word here. 
um, that I mm. found out what it was yesterday. It's called vicarious liability. <laughs> Please tell us. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of listeners don't know what vicarious liability is. It sounds amazing and fun because it says it's got the word vicarious in there. But it's actually quite scary. Yeah, it is. It is a, a sounds sounds a bit scary and sounds very technical. But um, vicarious liability is anything to do with, even though you're not directly involved with that operation. Um, there, there is an association of that. So basically, if someone's clinic is offering uh, dermal fillers, for example, and they employ or uh, bring in a nurse to administer those uh, dermal fillers who's not employed by them, but is basically a, a contractor, the face of the clinic will, can get dragged in vicariously for any disputes as a direct result of that treatment. Basically, vicarious liability or imputer liability is an indirect liability for the actions of another person. So basically what that means, it sounds complicated, but what it means is in mm. our industry, a lot of clinics, salons, spas will bring in, say, a doctor to come in, or either rent a room or a nurse mm -hmm. to perform yep. medical or paramedical treatments or medical aesthetic treatments, you know, injectables. They could even have a nurse coming in to operate a laser within their their business and then it's set up as a contractual arrangement uh, or a room hire arrangement or even a percentile arrangement so that's right that they are not technically employees they're coming in and doing a service and so we think well they're the clients that they're seeing fall under their insurance sure they might fall under their insurance but if something were to happen mm -hmm. the actual clinic that the person the the professional goes into is also mm. at risk and can also be dragged into the claim. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because, you know, they're coming in there and you are basically, you know, you not, may not be supervising, but you are liable for their negligent actions on behalf of you because they've come into your practice clinic on behalf of whoever it might be. However, they've booked the premises or the consultation, whatever it might be. I've walked into the door, I've seen, you know, Abic Proprietary Limited at the front, but I'm seeing Stephanie, who's going to administer this lovely treatment i've had an adverse reaction i go to a lawyer they're going to drag in they're going to say where did you go i saw i went to abic okay well abic proprietary limited and stephanie are going to get dragged into litigation so mm -hmm. it's not only protecting you need to make sure you've got this coverage arranged or disclose that to the insurer to make sure that your liability policy will cover you in the event of anything like this happening right so make sure that you're covered for subcontractors and contractors coming into your business because if mm -hmm. they do something within their own scope of practice that is liable for a claim, you, even though you're a separate business, can get dragged into it. This is very important for everybody mm. that does have contracting nurses coming in or does have a, you know, a doctor coming in or works with another clinic to provide services for their clients. Always best to find out, do they have insurance? Are they mm -hmm. covered? And are you covered for this type of arrangement as well? Chris, we could talk yeah. all day. Thank you so much. Oh, for of course we can. I appreciate your time, Steph, as always. Look, stay tuned, everybody. We will have some more uh, part of the series, the insurance series, um, to educate our, our members um, and the community about the risks that, you know, we befall when we don't understand such a complicated system such as, such as insurance and all the regulations and mm. requirements for it. So thank you so much yeah. again, Chris. Come back again. And yeah, always. And if anyone has any questions, by all means, send them through to yourself, Steph, and uh, we'll try and answer them as best we can. Or maybe even if we have a whole lot of questions, we can even do a podcast to answer those questions generally. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. reached the end of another episode of the Beauté by Abic podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Thank you for listening and until next time, stay connected.